Hello and welcome to uh, the first ever Wheel to Meadows uh, question time. I'm delighted to be holding it at Wakehurst Place. Um, Wakehurst are, are custodians of um, the Loder Valley Nature Reserve, which has some, some beautiful traditional meadows. Um, but not only do they look after those, um, they've also done a number of um, grassland restoration projects. They've restored um, diversified Bloomers Valley. Um, they've had a, a restoration project around the Millennium Sea Bank where they've, they've created a, a, a species rich grassland from scratch. And, and more recently, they've restored, um, I think it's five hectares, isn't it, Ian, of, of improved grassland to species rich grassland. Uh, very much with the objective of creating something that that captures the essence of the high wield. Um, so I'd like to thank them thank them now for, for agreeing to, to host this event. Um, right, I'd like to introduce the panel. On my far right, we have David David Martin. On my right, uh, Keith Datchler. Uh, far left, um, Ralph Hobbs, and on my left, Ian Parkinson. Um, I'm not going to read through their biographies, they, they were on the website if, if you were booking this event via, via Eventbrite. I think needless to say, between them they have a huge amount of knowledge and expertise, uh, probably over a century's worth. <laughs> so, and, and they're very much... Um, Three quarters of that <laughs> <laughs> They're very much our meadows go to. We've got what well, David works for Natural England in a sort of national role, so he's very much a go-to person for Natural England staff if they've got questions about, about grasslands and grassland management. And Keith, Routh and Ian are, are very much our go-tos um, in the world and I know have, have been inspiring and continue inspire, to inspire everybody um, to, to look after and care, care for our very special grasslands in this area. Um, we're playing it a little bit by ear today. We've never done a question time. We're not quite sure um, how long the answers are going to take to the questions. We'll fit in as many as we possibly can. Um, if you don't get to ask your question in the next sort of hour and a quarter, there will be an opportunity to ask questions as we walk around um, the meadows later. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to do that at the, the end of the event. Um, I think what we, we, we're definitely aiming for is the frivolity of gardeners' question time. We're, we're not here to do the serious, you know, any questions approach. Um, I'm sure the panel members will not be trying to evade the questions. They will, they will be giving you a direct answer to your questions, I hope. So, um, so without um, further ado, I think we'll move on to the, the first question, which is coming from Jill. Could I just ask that when you ask your question, you, you introduce yourself and maybe just say a few words about, about your grassland. That would be great. Thank you. I want George to answer that little bit of apple. We've got little... Bolted meadow which hasn't been altered, but it's got some common spotted orchids in it, and I hoped they would spread. And I didn't know the best time to cut the grass for hay to enable that to happen. Be great for some advice. Okay, okay David, are you okay uh, to kick off with yeah, our first I'll, question? Uh, I can try it, yeah. <laughs> um, originally, I mean, I come from a background of. Uh, design and implementing agri-environment schemes and originally in the, the early agri-environment schemes we were very much focused on setting cutting dates you know after which you know it's safe to kind of cut your meadows and things will flower and seeded but th that's very much a sort of blunt instrument you know we've got we're more these days we tend to look at how long you know we close up meadows for to allow the kind of plants to to develop to, to seed set stage um, and help people, well, help people judge when that might be in terms of hay quality, um, hay quantity, as well as the sort of botanical aspects. And a, a classic uh, thing we often use with people is to, to look at the hay rattle in the swarm because that, that's an annual, so it's imperative that that returns seeds. So, you know, when the proportion of the population gets to the brown flower stage, the dry calyx, and we've got the the seeds ready to, to set seed inside and then importantly is the hay meadow management the drying and turning that allows the seed to to set um but a lot of plants <coughs> in meadows are actually perennials they don't necessarily need to return seeds every every year uh, and orchids obviously are perennials and in, in, orchids are interesting and they're 
a number of respects, but one of them is the very small, tiny size of the seeds, 0 0.1, 0.2 millimetres, so they're almost like sand. Um, so therefore you, have, you can have quite wide dispersal of orchid seeds on the wind and probably inadvertently carried around by all sorts of animals. Uh, but by the same token, you've got seed coming in from orchids elsewhere in the, the landscape. So I think the key thing is to have the conditions right for germination, to have your soil fertility relatively low, and to have a short swarm going into the springtime to let plants germinate. And dactyl arise, you spotted orchids, will also spread vegetatively as well from the overwinter. Tubers. I'm not exactly sure on the mechanism for doing that, but they will spread vegetatively. Um, and also, you know, they don't, they don't flower uh, quickly either. It can be three plus probably more, five, six years before they're actually flowering. So you may well have a population coming on that, you, you know, you're not absolutely... And they don't necessarily flower every year either. So I think my um, summary is get the conditions right for growth and germination and manage, you know, if, if you have control or you know people that have orchids and other sites nearby, manage them as a sort of meta population to ensure they're getting a chance to spread their seed around the, the area. Oh, right. does, that, does that help? Oh, that is a big help, yeah, thank you. I guess July, um, I mean, if you do want them to flower and go through the cycle, they generally flower in June. They've got quite a long flowering window, but it's June into sort of early August, I think, isn't it? So you can look and see when the spikes are drying up and, and you know, they're becoming desiccated and, and go through the hay cutting cycle. Something they need to eat flowers off, they've got a lot of them just live flowers. Oh. <coughs> I've tried to on them. Right, yeah. Deer, possibly? Deer. Yeah. 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 Slugs as well. Slugs. Mm. <laughs> also, uh, orchid seed is very, very short lived. Um, so if you are buying orchid seed, or, or the advice I would give it, if you're trying to introduce orchids using seed, um, make sure you do it as quickly as possible. Um, orchid seed has a very thin uh, coat, uh, and therefore it's very short-lived. So there's viability issues to, to, to be concerned about. So the, the best way to reintroduce or introduce orchids into your meadow is to find somewhere very close by, uh, wait till the seed is viable um, and has set, so round about July, August time, cut it and transfer it very, very quickly. Because if you store it, or if you don't do that quickly, the viability will decrease really, really quickly. You'll wonder why it wasn't successful, uh, and the reason will be that your seed wasn't viable when you transferred it to your site. So it's really important to, to remember that. And then to be patient. It can take three, five, sometimes seven years uh, from seed uh, to having a flowering spike. But it is worth the wait, because uh, when you see it, uh, it does make it all worthwhile. No, I, th I think that the word patience might come up a fair wow. bit and amongst the uh, answers today. Right, um, we'll move on to our next question. So we're going from orchids, which I think everyone aspires to have in their meadow, to something that, that people don't really want to see in their meadow. So, so Lorna, our second question, Hello. please. Um, yes, sir. Um, creeping thistles have recently spread in my grasses. What would cause this? And what can I do to keep it in check? Mm -hmm. One for you. Thank you, Lorna. <laughs> I've had the benefit of seeing your thistles, so I can at least tailor my answer a little bit. How many of you have got thistles in your grassland? Creeping thistle. <laughs> yes, there's probably more fields with creeping thistle in, albeit being under control, than fields without in, in the wider countryside, unless you're very intensively managed and spraying a lot. Um, why have you got thistles? could be because they've been there hundreds of years um, at very low level. It could be that the field went through an episode of bare ground exposure and seed drifted in and, and um, young plants established. And of course, once they're established, they have runners and 
we all know how difficult it is to deal with thistles. Um, can you think of anything in the past which might have encouraged thistles, like lots of poaching? No, not lots of poaching. Um, we had a couple of, in 2016, hay was been tentative cut and wasn't. Um, and it was too long. We had no access to cattle. We had sheep, but the sheep could only take what they could take from it because the soil was so tall by the time they could trample it far from anything else. So we flailed it. We did collect as much as we could, but it's 14 acres in this particular field. Um, but in the following year, we had absolute incredible flora here. It was amazing. There was very little grass. But 2017-2018 was what I would call it a disastrous. We suddenly, it's like a nutrient spike, and we've got all these, all these thistles and grasses and far fewer wildflowers. Um, and the thistles have spread from small patches into substantial patches that I used to be able to hoe, and I'm now looking at topping. And my question is really, is how can you top thistles and then top them again? And, without losing the wildflowers that you're also trying to encourage, which I've spent many years trying to encourage and I don't want to do is what I've achieved by topping and topping. So I home and that means I've got to be everywhere at once and it's just not possible. Any, any answers please? Well, as, as David said, most plants in a meadow are perennials and unless you've got yellow rattle, which is a key annual, or some of the other lesser, um, less common annuals, you can go through, you know, keeping it short for a whole year and not worry too much by doing your thistle control by cutting regularly. The key time is to cut at purple bud stage, as you probably know, which is when the plants have used all of their resources from underground and before they start sending resources back for storage over winter, ready for the next year. And once you've cut at purple bud stage, you then cut again a month later to further reduce the feedback of nutrients into those underground stems. Purple bud stage can, can um, start a month early on with some plants compared with other plants. And so there's never a perfect time to, to cut a purple bud stage. And what you've been doing with hoeing individual plants, if you've only got a small set, that would be the way to do it because then each stem you can get a purple bud stage. And you'll probably go three times and get them that way. But if you're cutting with a machine, then you need to do it at least twice um, and then keep going because it'll take you three or four years probably to really notice a, a big difference. Don't worry about having a few thistles, but just keeping them under control rather than trying to eliminate them is, is the way forward, really. And you're organic, so I know you're, you're restricted to that kind of an approach. But if, if you're not organic and you want to spot spray, then that's quite an effective way of doing it, provided you haven't got acres and acres with a, with a knapsack sprayer. Um, and then you've got a choice between two products. is Roundup, which is going to kill anything that is also growing next to the plants, or Grazon, I think it's called Pro now, which doesn't kill grass but does kill a lot of other plants as well as thistles. Um, if you're next to water, you, you'd be restricted to using Roundup because um, Grazon is, is not allowed close to water. Um, anything else to say about that? Yeah. I think, um, sorry, Keith, you go. Yeah, in, in the establishment phase, you often get these great rafts of thistles that will come in because you've had soil disturbance in the establishment. And uh, we, we have topped, and they do tend to be in rafts. Uh, I don't know if you would yeah. agree. The, and you, you can go into a 14 acre field and top those patches and you still get your hay crop and you'll still get your annuals and then your annuals will spread back into the patches where you may have lost them because of the constant topping and it gives you a mosaic anyway mm. so I wouldn't be afraid to get in there with a, with a tractor and top out the worst of them and then maybe back up with your hand weeding um, there's, there's potentially a grazing aspect as well um, we funded some experimental work at one point on uh, sort of cultural control of, of thistles and grazing in the autumn seemed to be a key to you know subsequent invasion and or germination in the spring. So if you, if you graze to keep the soil fairly tall in the autumn, going into winter, that tends to reduce uh, invasion from thistles. Mm. 
So are you suggesting that we don't answer that phrase if we were to cut, cut the head? Um, it's, all, it's a balance, isn't it? Because you want to aftermath graze to, you know, get some of your seeds and things trampled in and we've talked about, you know, the, the need to create um, germination opportunities in the spring from a relatively short swarm. But if thistles are a problem, as I think Ralph said, maybe for a year or two you want to concentrate on getting on top of the, the thistles and, and um, autumn grazing. You know, you, you could aftermath graze, you know, soon after the hay cut, but then get the animals out and let things grow up a bit again uh, and just let this work to, you know, get, get a bit taller, so I don't know, 10 centimetres or so, and just try and avoid some of that germination opportunity as you go into the springtime. I think also it, it's patience and perseverance. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're so impatient these days. We want results for all of our hard work. Meadows are centuries old, or the good ones are. And over those years, they've ebbed and flowed, fallen into kind of Dirty. neglect, uh, and then they've been brought back. Um, and so we tend to take quite a long-term view here and accept some years... Um, things tend to get away from you. I often think it's like riding a wild horse managing a meadow. Some years you feel as if you've got hold of the reins and you're in control and then for whatever reason all of a sudden the horse bolts, uh, some weeds will come in and, and you feel out of control. That's when you've really got to apply yourself uh, and persevere with it and things like thistles just keep hitting them by whatever means, just to weaken them. Uh, uh, there's all sorts of ecological reasons, but, but for me, a lot of it is just about in, imposing your own influence over the meadow uh, and, and treating it as, as a little bit of a challenge. Um, and also accepting that, that you know, these are a good pollinating plants as well. And a few, it is absolutely fine, and every meadow should probably have some and we should celebrate them a little bit. There's a fine line between a flower being a weed and something that we celebrate. But I do share your um, concerns. And a bit later, I'll proudly show you some of our creeping thistles as well. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the same work yeah. we looked at thistle control, we did actually look at the uh, pollinator, number of pollinators as well, and there was a positive relationship yeah. <laughs> with the uh, number of thistle seed heads and, and pollinators. So, yeah, that's a good point. Not I think I'd caution just slightly against t not doing the aftermath grazing, or, or at least timing it, like you said, a little bit more precisely, perhaps. Because that is the key for reducing the, the vigour of the grasses mm. in pre preparation for the spring growth. If you've got overwintered, tall, tusky grasses, already the flowers are going to be struggling, and your grass will be dominating even more than it, than it would otherwise. Unfortunately, yeah, I mean, it's the same mechanism that allows your thistles to germinate yeah. and mm. proliferate yeah. as it does your wild flowers, yeah. so you need to make a decision about what, yeah. Yeah. what is priority yeah. at, that, at that, that time. And, and they do go, there's no question. We, yeah. We've had great rafts of thistles, and suddenly you've got a year where they've gone. I, I've cleared fields, but I've never come back. Yeah. And I've done that by hoeing. Right. Um, where we found that the stands were particularly close together, which is what we inherited from the first orchard farm, um, after having really hammered them with my home, which is what I generally do, we do occasionally, we have occasionally resorted to topping on these early, early patches. Um, but I found that when I hoed them, I lost a whole lot, they a whole lot went. But these, these, this field, it, they are more extensive and less intensive. And so they seem to be spread out in, over a much larger area. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I've Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, I, think, I think that'd be... Quickly One more thing. <laughs> have, have any of you noticed this is turning white and kind of being suppressed by some kind of a infestation, infection? Mm -hmm. I, I checked on this. I forget every year what the name of it is. I'm not going to tell you what the name of it is now. Big, long Latin name. But it's a bacterium which has come into this country apparently about 10 years ago. And um, somebody's been experimenting by cutting with shears the infected white plants, bleach plants, and then cutting um, normal thistles, and that way the disease is transmitted. <laughs> so it's thought that the regular cutting has kind of spread it. Um, 
at least within fields and probably between fields as well. So it's something we could probably you know, work with mm. if you've got it. Mm. Um, right, I'm, I'm sure we're going to come back to that on the, the walk later on, I, I sense. Uh, right, our third question, David. So, David Jarson, Ashburn Place. Um, we've got uh, 12 acres of permanent pasture that is cut regularly uh, during the summer months and is used as a sort of sports, <laughs> sports leisure ground. Um, the ground is used for half a dozen camping events throughout the summer as well as a leisure recreation space. We'd like to revert this field to a wildflower meadow but to continue to use it for ground for camping. Two questions really. Uh, on the best way to establish the meadow currently down to a, sort of a rye grass mix and on the ongoing management options once the meadow has been established. Mm. Mm. Right. <laughs> it's rather like saying I'd love a crystal chandelier, but I live in an earthquake zone. Um, I think <laughs> it's you, getting the word uh, campsite and meadow in the same sentence is, is a challenge in itself. But do you use the entire 12 acres, and have you got to use the entire 12 acres, or could you have? A segregated area where you had a meadow within it and then continued to use the rest of it for camping because I think to actually have a wildflower meadow and you were camping within it six times a year I don't know when your first camping event is and when your last camping event is mm -hmm. but if you're exploiting British summer such as it is mm -hmm. this is going to be what June till September yeah the first camping event is at the beginning of July right right yeah, I, th I think the, the window is too short to actually be able to grow a wildflower meadow and use the same area for camping. And the others may disagree with me. But um, I would have a separate area or maybe have a headland all the way around the field because it would be a huge attraction for your, for your camping. Yeah. Um, so I would go some and some. Maybe if you had four acres at one end of the field and you could mow lovely paths through it, invite your campus to, an in to, to come and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You're cutting regularly, you're cutting and removing or cutting and leaving the cuttings laying there at the moment? We're leaving the cuttings. And how long has that been going on? Oh, 10, 15 plus years. Okay, have you any idea what the fertility is like? No. Okay, it would be worth having a soil sample before you start. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a general criteria which we can move into the second part of your question really and that is you know, the general assessment which goes for all wildflower meadows when you arrive on a new patch. Um, I have a sort of tick box in, in my head but have you got good fencing if you're considering aftermath grazing? Have you got a water supply? Obviously you've got good access because you're getting in there already with equipment. Do a soil test, make sure you've got relatively low fertility ideally. I mean, it will always get good results from low fertility. Mm. Grass is a thug, ryegrass is a particular thug, and it will outcompete everything, which is what the yellow rattle is all about. Mm. Try and get as much yellow rattle in as possible because it's semi-parasitic on grass roots. So you, you could go that route, I would think. Have an area which is wildflowers and will be an, an, an attraction to your campsite. Mm. But I, I cannot think of a way where you could have a wildflower meadow and camp mm -hmm. within it on that kind of scale mm -hmm. without it being very, very complicated, you know, mowing little paths in and having areas that were mown might look quite attractive. But then you've got to encourage all your campers to stay out of it or be flattened, which is why I say rather like having an earth, you know, an earthquake zone and a crystal chandelier. But um, go through those processes and, and we can give you advice, specific advice on how to create a wildflower meadow. Always use local provenance seed. So I mean, you're very local to to the battle area. There's the Wheel Meadows Initiative, which is a good supply of, of uh, local provenance seed. Um, and more than that, I think it's difficult difficult to say. But I, I unless someone else can think of a way of running a campsite mm -hmm. and a wildflower meadow as one and the same thing, I would say have two separate areas and make it an attraction for your campsite. 
There, there is a farmer uh, I know in the Yorkshire Dales who does exactly what you say. He cuts little squares in the town. It looks like a checkerboard in his field, mm. but he, he is bonkers though. So. <laughs> 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 but if you want to do that, that's what yeah. it um, And also it depends on the intensity. I mean, I, I don't know what sort of numbers you're going to cram onto your 12 acres. Uh, and can you graze through the winter? We're, we're, not, we're not grazing at the moment. But have you got a fence and a water supply? It's not fenced, but we do have a water supply. Access to livestock? Yeah. All right. Sheep and cattle, or just? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that'd be Richard White, I guess, but it would come and yeah. graze those for you, yeah. Okay, yeah, but you will need good fencing, and that, we've already touched on it a couple of times, but that winter and aftermath grazing would be absolutely, it really is crucial to keeping on top and creating a good meadow. Yeah. You have these little windows of opportunity yeah. for uh, uh, germination, which have to be taken autumn and spring. And that's the only times you're going to get these windows of opportunity for generation, for regeneration, mm -hmm. and uh, without the aftermath grazing. I've seen so many good projects fail on aftermath grazing. It's a crucial point of it. And we were having a discussion a few weeks ago, and we were saying we should really be holding a meadow event in February in a field mm -hmm. so that we can say to people, this is what it should look like. Mm -hmm. Because when you say graze it hard, everybody's got a different idea of what hard grazing is. But it, you really do need an almost a scorched earth policy. It doesn't matter how much earth you're looking at in February, it'll be a good thing. Come have, have you got time just to, just to sort of promote the grazing as opposed to topping or baling? Um, if you're going to graze instead of topping or baling and you're running a campsite, uh, you've then got to have some kind of separation again mm -hmm. between the campers and the cattle. So it's going to be an electric fence or a permanent fence, which I wouldn't have thought was going to be quite so attractive. <coughs> but, it, but you could, if it's an attraction rather than quality of feed, mm -hmm. you could leave a very late cut, which would make for quite an interesting meadow. You could yeah. go in there after your last campus have disappeared, you could go in there in uh, September mm -hmm. and, and oh. take a cut. It won't be very good quality mm -hmm. of hay, but you, you'll have a super meadow, and that will also set your grass back more for the coming winter mm. and reduce the need for the aftermath grazing, mm. depending on the fertility you've got. So mm. you will definitely need your soil sample. And also have a, have a, a vegetative um, assessment, a survey of what you've got, because you may find you've got more interesting things there already than you, than you believe when you let it grow out. So it's worth having a good survey. I um, used to go on holidays to the Isle of Wight when the kids were young, and we went to a glamping site <clears throat> where there were a series of yurts in a field. Mm -hmm. uh, this um, kind of owner, uh, I don't think was bonkers, um, but <laughs> possibly. Um, and they set these yurts in amongst wildflower meadows and orchards, and it looked absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. So that might be something mm -hmm. to consider. O also having really wide verges around the perimeters uh, of your field. Um, really wide margins, I think, would possibly be one way of doing it. You're not going to be able to manage it as a, a traditional meadow, just because you, you've got too many complications in there. So it's trying to arrive at, at, what, at what your expectation is. And sometimes when we think about creating meadows, we have to decide ourselves, well, why are we doing it? Are we trying to create something that's rich for biodiversity or are we trying to create something that's visually beautiful you, you know what's our intention um what what's your intention why do you want well, to i think it? i think biodiversity is, is probably right up there um but i think also just with the number of guests that we do have we want it to look beautiful <laughs> the beauty's in the behind the beholder and some people love the look of golf courses Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like a golf course at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, other people look at that and think, don't like to look at that at all. So I think for us, biodiversity is, is probably the top thing. So I think you know, we have two or three large camps a summer. Um, but I think with a little bit of creativity, we can sort of create areas of wildflower meadow within that, which will give us that, those sort of wildflower <coughs> corridors that we're, we're really keen to promote. Yeah. And but, I, don't, I don't know your site, but it might be that you already have on a wider scale, you've got existing areas which are quite biodiverse. And when you place your meadow in the 12 acres, you could think about making it a connection between two other areas. 
and also thinking about the visual beauty of it. Um, a cross between a golf course and a wildflower meadow on the same site actually looks stunning. Mm -hmm. So having really short grass, mm -hmm. really well managed, really crisp edges, mm -hmm. uh, and then going to a long meadow yeah. looks really, really good. So, so maybe striking yeah, looks, that balance. Looks very intended. Yeah. Yeah. And invite people in, have a path through it, yeah. rather than, you know, don't, ex don't make it exclusive, make it inclusive. And it's a really great way, actually. We, we've had sites here that we've been mowing for years and years and years. And I've never seen anyone walk through the field. As soon as we created a wildflower meadow and mowed a path through, all of a sudden you change the way people use the landscape. All of a sudden they're kind of immersed in that landscape simply by mowing the path through. It, it's it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. yeah. Just to pick up on the soil fertility, which is crucial isn't it so important I mean you know you, you might strive for you know to get a lot of sort of relatively uncommon or real high value species in there but if your soil fertility is you know moderate say then that, that might be hard work so just think about you know relatively common and wide spread things you know there are a suite of species that are you know you see in um, you know good good kind of semi-improved grassland that have quite wide ecological Tolerance so things like yarrow and maybe bird's foot trefoil and you know slightly more common things, but they can make you. I mean, I saw a place yesterday that was covered in bird's foot trefoil, and you know there wasn't much else in that field, but it looked absolutely fantastic. So don't just necessarily think about the uncommon orchids or whatever. Mm -hmm. Think about these things that actually have a good chance of growing in more more sort of places that have got a bit of fertility. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. It's about expectation. Yeah. And very, we talk a lot about soil fertility. And, and I've had advice here at Wakehurst over the years where the advice has been, oh, the, the soil conditions aren't, aren't good enough. They're, they're too nutrient rich. But because I've desperately wanted to create a meadow, I've just ignored it. <laughs> you know, a site full of creeping thistle, white clover, you know, the worst site. Um, it's just patience. 12, 15 years later, with mm. ongoing management every single year, mm. you, 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 you can create something. What you can create is um, what that particular site will allow you to create. Mm. And you just have to know what, what your expectation is and also understand what, what the site is going to create for you. And then you need to decide whether you want to put all that energy in to, to, to what the site can offer. Mm you've got a really good site, really low nutrients, um, then you know, you'll be really rewarded. Um, but yeah, celebrating some of the common species, mm -hmm. you know, we shouldn't overlook that. And, and can we evaluate it you know, a few years down the line? Has, has it changed? Has the soil yeah, fertility absolutely. gone down? Can we, re can we introduce some other things that maybe were hard, hard work early on or whatever? You know? So it's, it's a work in progress, isn't it? It's a lifetime project, possibly. Yeah, yeah you've got to enjoy it. As, as well, because you've got to carry on doing it every single year. The yeah. thing that the, the, the failure with, with all meadow creations is there's great excitement for the first couple of years, uh, but then it's, it can be hard work. Uh, and, and if you miss one or two years of managing it, you'll undo all of that work. So you've got to enjoy it, there's got to be an incentive to do it. And don't rush ahead and do acres and acres and acres. Start out quite small because you know, the, the more you do, the greater the potential is for disappointment. Whereas if you do a small bit, get the hang of it, and then expand out. And with, in your case, you know, deciding where you're going to have the longer grass, and maybe just having that longer grass in year one, see what you get. You may get a surprise. And it will look nice, as Ian says, you know, this, comp, this juxtaposition, if you want to be modern. Um, that difference is really interesting. And if you can, if you, if you have got maybe bands with thinner soils, and that's a, you know, if you target your uncut areas, that, that, that's where you're more likely maybe to get you know, some of the more interesting species because inherently the soil is leached and there's lower fertility. So if you've got that, those sort of areas, yeah, look at, look at those. Thank you. We'll, we'll move on to the next question, which also touches on, on meadow restoration creation, um, and it's um, Matthew. Yes. Um, um, the RCB. Um, we were planning... Sorry, 
Uh, we are planning on spreading uh, wheeled native orange and seed on our grassland uh, to increase its diversity. Um, what would be your key tips to ensure that the project is successful? Um, and if we can't get hold of wheeled native uh, seed, what other seed would you recommend? Um, well, good question. And yeah, we don't see why you should have to escape having a microphone poked in front of you. <laughs> um, uh, so I was listening to Keith uh, answering the, the question um, before, and as he worked down his checklist on the things he looks for when he's thinking about restoring or creating a meadow, uh, I could see my answer here uh, being repeated, because all the things that Keith was talking about are the things I, I look for in, in a site. First and foremost, is it accessible? Are you going to be able to get equipment and machinery there? Is it a wet or dry site? Is there fencing? Are you going to be able to graze it? Because the, you know, it's all about management. Um, there's a number of phases for creating a wildflower meadow. All the excitement is in the seed sowing. But after that, it's all about management. And you've got to have the infrastructure in place to deliver that management. So you've got to have good access. They're fencing, so you can graze it. We've spoken about aftermath grazing. You can't underestimate or undervalue how important that is. And I think the biggest compliment I've ever had about our meadows here at Wakehurst was from Margaret Pilkington, who's well known uh, locally. She's uh, Emeritus Senior Lecturer at the University of Sussex. One of my meadow mentors, as are many people up here. Uh, and she emailed me in February uh, a few years ago and said, Ian, your meadows are looking exactly as they should in winter. And what she meant was it was really open sward, really tightly grazed, and, and all that bare earth allows seed to set uh, and germinate. And then in the spring there's lots of light, uh, and it's as simple as that, but it's really difficult to achieve that without grazing. So thinking about your, your project, um, seed is important, and we'll talk about that in a minute, <clears throat> but it's about infrastructure. Have you got the infrastructure in place, and then have you got the energy, the resources, or the, the financials to carry out that management year in, year out? Uh, one of the most important things is taking your hay cut. You, you've, you've, you've really got to cut it and remove it. And this is interesting because when do you take that hay cut? Uh, my advice is to mix it up, sometimes throw in quite an early cut. Sometimes we, we throw a cut in in June um, and then you get a second flush later in the season. Don't always cut it at the same time and don't do what I did in Bloomers Valley, um, the meadows there, which is always to take a late cut, end of August, September. I did that because I wanted our visitors to enjoy uh, the wildflowers, and now I've got a meadow full of knapweed. Um, it favours later flowering and later seeding plants, and we've lost biodiversity and diversity because of it. So mix, mix that up, but remove the cuttings. This helps to reduce the fertility in the soil. If you top it, you'll just end up with a really thick thatch, uh, and that will stop seed from setting and will stop seed from germinating. So don't cut, cut, remove, and then graze. Um, I, I always think before you start a meadow restoration or creation, is allow it to grow for the first year. Just see what's there. You know, you may be surprised. There may be all sorts of interesting things there. It may be full of creeping thistle, of course. And if it is, and there's a really bad weed problem, at least you know what you're dealing with. The last thing you want to do is put a lot of effort and energy and cost into purchasing seed, etc., uh, only to find that when you allow the meadow to grow in the second year, it's full of weeds. Um, and then you've got a real battle on your hands. Um, so seed is, is, is the key as well. Um, we're really lucky in the high weald. Um, that we have uh, wild native origin seed available. I think, Ralph, you're involved in some of the early sort of production of that seed, um, and it's carried on now by Keith and Dawn and others. 
This is local provenance, uh, so there's a lot of talk and debate about whether to use local provenance seed. Um, and there's arguments for and there's arguments against. Uh, a lot of seed that you can buy online uh, will come from Europe. Is, is that the end of the world? Well, some people say it is, and some people say it isn't. Um, and uh, I'm not going to, to comment on that, only to say that for me, it makes sense to use local seed. A, because it's there, it's freely available, it's cheaper, and it will have all that kind of genetic character. And what will be there is appropriate for the site that, that you will be restoring or creating. Uh, as you move around the country, from region to region, every region, the meadows have their own personalities, characteristics. It's so important that we retain that. The high wield has its own personality in terms of its meadow. meadow. So the last thing we want to be doing is introducing things that wouldn't ordinarily uh, be in these meadows. So using local provenance seed, world native origin seed is the best. If you can't have that, then cut some green hay uh, from a meadow that, that's local to you and spread that around. Um, and if the worst comes to the worst and you have to buy your seed online, buy it from a, a, a respected uh, supplier, Emma's Gate, so someone that has some, some kind of history behind them. My advice to you is, is don't think that that seed is alive. Test it. So if you're going to spend many hundreds of pounds on seed uh, and you put it out into your meadow, there's many reasons why it might not grow. One of those may be that it, the seed wasn't viable. Now, you won't know that if you've spread it, so retain some, grow it in your nursery just to make sure it's viable. And then, you know, the most important thing to get established is yellow rattle. You, you all know this is a hemiparasitic plant. This will really help get on top of your grasses. It's amazing. Farmers used to hate it. Because mm -hmm. this, you know, meadows is all about producing hay, essentially grass. And, and this would really um, deplete that, that hay production. But these days, of course, we use it to help restore our meadows. And it, and it is amazing. It's also an annual. So we can control it. There's too much of it then uh, we, we can graze it out. Um, and sometimes it does establish so much that, that you're, you'll have very few grasses in your meadow. The important thing to remember is that over time, it will find its balance. So never rush in with your meadow. Just stand back and observe what's happening and look at it as a kind of lifetime project and not something that we need to worry unduly about every year. Uh, but getting this in the meadow is important. <clears throat> but then there's also many things that are really hard to, to get going. This is Dyer's Greenweed. This is uh, something that we celebrate in the high wield. This is a beautiful plant. It's got a really thick seed coat and really difficult to get going by seed. So we grow it as plant plugs. Look at all those roots. <clears throat> if you plant this out in the meadow, this will really get going. But if you plant it out as... It's Dyer's Greenweed, Ginista Tinctoria. Don't think I carry that Latin round in my head. <laughs> I looked it up uh, earlier today. Um, so yeah, there's different methods. Using seed, uh, using green hay, but, but then also plant plugs as well. Thank you. Did other panel members want to add to that? Since he um, brought his plants along, I've got nothing as exciting, but um, I thought I'd men mention our technical information notes, which covers a lot of these aspects of meadow restoration, including the use of yellow rattle. So these are available, and they're harder to find these days, but they are available through the Floodplain Meadows Partnership website, uh, and they're also in the depths of our Natural England publications catalogue somewhere. They're a little bit outdated. They, they could be there with being updated because obviously they refer to previous schemes and such like. But the, the, the basis of them is still pretty sound and it's based on you know research and experience that covers a lot of what Ian has talked about. So so dig these out if you can. Use of yellow rattle, sword enhancement uh, using uh, species rich green hay, 
selection of suitable sites to cover various aspects of the, the things that you've, you've um, talked about. The, the other thing I was going to mention in source, I, I mean, we're not entirely against you know, using something like a, a reputable source from Emmer's Gate that's, that's based on native uh, origin seed, but be wary around things like designated sites that we're not getting across kind of contamination. So, you know, our advice is always if you're near a triple SI um, to use as local origin seed as you can get your hands on. We've got quite a few projects that have been successful in using, using green hay from um, triple SI meadows or high quality meadows uh, in restoration of other other sites. So that's that's a good approach. And I've also got a colleague uh, up in the northeast who's um, been sourcing seed by hand locally and growing them on in big tubs and multiplying them up in big and this is this is I think there are more tubs every year, you know, and taking over like other people's backyards and things <laughs> like that. But you know, it, it that's a good way of getting some local stuff and rather than just put it, you know, tiny amount straight on the meadow, grow it on for a year or two and multiply the seed number up and that you've got a seed source there to um, you know, add into your grassland. So that's worth thinking about if you've got some space to, to do it and some big tubs. One small, just one word of caution with Yellow Rattle, and I don't want to make all this sound too complicated. We've, we've gone on rather about winter grazing. If you, a word of caution on Yellow Rattle is if you persist with your winter grazing too long, mm -hmm. Yellow Rattle is super tasty if you're a sheep. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it starts to germinate, you can lose it in the spring if you've left your animals grazing too long. They will take it out before they take out anything else. They will literally go around and pinch it all out. So be in your meadow all the time. Be watching it and enjoying it. It's not a, it's not purgatory. Um, but just watch what it does. And as soon as you see yellow rattle beginning to germinate, animals off. I just wanted to emphasise the importance of years one and two management, which are going to be different from your ongoing management thereafter because your years one and two is all about establishment. Um, you're sowing in the autumn, you're getting some autumn germination, you might get some spring germination, but the whole of that second year you want to keep the, the sward nice and short because that way you're keeping the grasses lower, you're maintaining the bare ground a little bit longer for those tiny little plants to establish. Um, and then by the end of the second year you should be able to see so at the end of the year after you sow, you should then be able to see a scattering of seedlings, particularly things like knapweed um, and plantains, things that are going to come up first. Don't worry if you don't see other things, they will be coming on afterwards. But do keep that first year nice and short. Now I had a, a case of advising that exactly like that, and the landowner of his own volition bought some yellow rattle and chucked that on as well. Um, well, luckily he spread it, he didn't actually chuck it on, he spread it very, very well and we have a sea of yellow rattle, really even, and that has had the same effect by, of, of reducing the growth as if he was grazing it. Now in the normal way that would be contradictory because if you put yellow rattle in you want it to grow up seed, and therefore you shouldn't keep it short because you want, it, you want to allow the yellow rattle to flower. But in this case, he did it so well that it actually had the same effect of keeping it nice and short, grazed. It, yeah, it, it's interesting. And, and I sometimes, we talk, spoke about patience, but when you put so much effort into getting the seed and preparing your site, what, what do you want? You want to see something in the first year. So the temptation not to cut it mm -hmm. in the first year growing season um, was too much for me on a few occasions and, and I just let it grow. Interestingly though, when I looked a year later at the paths that I'd mown through, uh, the seedlings in there were phenomenal because I kept uh, mowing it and there was a little light getting to these seedlings. And then when I let the whole area grow up, um, these paths were, were, were kind of, you could see where the paths were just because the diversity in those paths was much greater. Mm. So Ralph's absolutely right. Seeds need light to, to grow. Uh, and if you let your grass grow up, it flops over uh, and they won't survive. That you then have to decide when to add yellow rattle. Because if you add it 
initially and you're mowing it, you're going to mow it out. So don't add it first of all, but add it in the second year. Um, or so, even the third. Or even the third, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to our next question, question five. Mark. Yeah. Now, we have recently acquired a two-acre plot of land on the edge of the Ashdown Forest. The soil condition is very clayey and deeper down sandstone. The field was used, um, as far as we know, uh, last by grazing ponies. Um, we hope to turn it into a biodiverse plot of land, biodiverse in the sense of plants and animals. And my question is, what is the easiest way of assessing my grassland to get a sense of whether my work to enhance it has worked or not? Mm -hmm. Well, this is back to, the, back to the same question of knowing what you've got before you start. Um, do you know how to identify the commoner grass and flowers? Yes? My wife. <laughs> <laughs> there are some publications available to help you. Um, field guides are good, but they're complicated with all those other species that look exactly the same as the one you're wondering whether it's that or not. Um, so pick a more simpler publication, probably, on meadows, especially in southeast England, which can be different from elsewhere, um, and start making a list. Now, an alternative is to get somebody in who can help you and, and recognise all those species immediately. Um, and if you can record all the grasses as well as all the flowers, it's much better to do that as well. Um, there are grass identification sheets as well. The good one is from the Field Studies Council. Um, make a list. Now that'll tell you what you've got, um, and that's your baseline if you like, so that in future you can then compare what else you might find subsequently. But even better than just making a list is to actually assess how abundant each of those species may be to give you a much better baseline. And there's a scale of abundance called DAFOR. I don't know if you've come across this word. It's an acronym, D-A-F-O-R. Yeah. Dominant, abundant, frequent, occasional, rare. And those are five labels to give your species. And by rare, we mean you've got a couple of plants in the field. Not rare naturally, just rare for your particular plot. And if you assign those abundance levels to each of the plants, you can then compare in the future. <laughs> Job coming on, I can tell, look on your face. <laughs> um, there are people who will come out and help you do that. Uh, and maybe the first time is all you need, because from then on you can carry on yourself. Um, and it would be very good to do that every year because, as we probably hinted, meadows change with seasons, different rainfall patterns, mean different species have different abundances in different years. So long term, very good to keep that going. And then you can actually see whether there are real increases rather than just temporary increases. Can I, can I um, ask about um, um, the thistle? Because we are next to a lot of other fields hmm. that had a lot of... Uh, Horses and there are big areas of thistle, they are flowering now, and you keep talking about topping it. What I think is like a Chelsea chop, but maybe you don't mean that kind of topping. Topping, you mean cutting as low as possible to the ground? Oh, that's as low as possible. Yes. I would think you take the tops out, but that's it. means top is above ground and as opposed to underground. I All think right. that's what, what it's referring to the top of the plant. <laughs> Okay, yeah. and can I go into the, there's nobody there, can I just get Ooh. the <laughs> and just get it? <laughs> I would find out who it is and yeah. speak to them very well, nicely. I mean, we know, I mean, okay. is, is that a way for the plant, or will it only make the plant stronger uh, if I take away the, the seeds and the, the flower heads? Well, if you can take the, stop it seeding and blowing into your fields, that's yeah. what you want. But that's bear in mind that previous years it's probably blown a load of seed and it's it's all there in your field anyway, yeah. even if it hasn't germinated yet. And once you start to prepare the ground for, for wildflower seed, you will give the, the thistle seeds just what they want too, to start germinating. It's, it, 
the best thing you'd hope for is if you're upwind rather than downwind. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I'm decided. <laughs> well, prevailing westerlies do have quite an influence. Thank you. I'm, I'm quite conscious of the time, so I'm sure. just going to move on to the next oh, question. And catch me in something. Well, yeah. I was just thinking about it. I mean, we we uh, have a project where we're working with farmers to help them um, monitor their meadows. And what we tend to promote is, as you say, but maybe choosing a route through the field, a diagonal transect or a W walk and having a number of even stops and you look at say, you know, a metre out feet and you record either all the species or as many as you can do or some key ones that you're, you know, you can identify from a list and that, that way you can get a frequency and then you can look at that. You can even take it if you have a GPS, you can mark your spots and that way you get much more of a, an indication of change over time. But you might also want to record other things because everybody says, oh, you know, this species was not, not on any of my stops, and the, you can record other things as well, but having repeatable stops gives you a better indication of how things have changed over time. Yeah, you've got two methods. Both is better than one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right, our next question, Celia. Hello. Uh, yes, Celia Cork in Wild. We have a project repairing and restoring the wildflower verges that have been eroded in the beautiful Willingford Lane in Burwash Weald. We know keeping the traffic off will be the most difficult part of the project. Do you have any tips for protecting them both while the seed is germinating and afterwards? We were considering uh, logs, posts with tape and willow whips and we've done two trial sites um, to see how it, it would work. Lovely, and this is the question we get asked quite a lot at the moment, is, is how to protect road verges across, across the high road. Yeah. So I think Keith, you are going yeah. to kick off this. Okay, um, yeah. Celia, we, we know We've one met. another already. <laughs> yes. yes, and you've certainly got a particular problem there in Willingford Lane. But it isn't uh, exclusive, unfortunately. You know, traffic is eroding a lot of our narrow lanes uh, significantly. I think don't try and exclude the traffic altogether. They, these narrow lanes do need passing places, so I think you have to accept that some of the areas will have to be left and they will be passing places. But the, I think there are two key things. Is the patience thing again, certainly it's been mentioned several times, but I think m my advice to you at the time was the bare areas, try and keep the traffic off, use dogs, I think you, you had several overhanging trees on that road, which wouldn't hurt if they came down. That would give you some nice lengths of timber that you could just place along. You've got a safety issue as well with roadside verges. You don't want to create something that may be a danger to traffic. So that's the other reason it's very important to maintain some passing places. But just loosen the soil, get, get some germination possibilities. It's the same advice that you'll keep hearing today you've got to create these niche opportunities for things to germinate mm -hmm. and then see what comes don't rush to introduce seed seed will probably be there and the seed that's there will be seed that has come from Willingford Lane so you haven't any issues with introducing exotic invasives and that kind of thing so keep the traffic off I think I said to you just if you do an eight foot strip see what happens see what germinates that's going to give you a really good clue for the rest of the lane um, <coughs> Where you've got total erosion and you need to bring soil to the site, again, be hugely careful. I would never recommend bringing soil in from somewhere else because you just don't know what you're going to get. But what you have got there at Wellingford Lane, you've got a huge amount of ditches, culverts and things. And some of the problem there is erosion. So if you get the drainage sorted out throughout the, the lane, and I would think that's a question of perhaps badgering the council, all that arising material that's coming out of the ditches may well have seed in it and of course it's come from nowhere other than Willingford Lane so you you could use that to do your repairs and again just as I, as I said to you I repeat it for the benefit of others just get a wheelbarrow clean out a section of ditch use it to repair somewhere that's been badly eroded put some logs down just wait see what happens my guess is you'll get enough reseeding from what is already there to, to do the necessary repairs. But sort out the drainage, that'll stop some of the erosion, 
maintain your passing places, use something which is at hand, logs, twigs, willow whips. Logs are pretty good. I think if, if you can see it there, psychologically you'll steer around it. Um, yes, once it's long, traffic will tend to be moving out, but of course most of the damage will be done in the winter when it's short and the ground is particularly susceptible to tire marks and so on. So do those two things. Have, a, have an experiment where it's simply been flattened, keeping the cars off, create a little bit of uh, turned soil, see what germinates, and do a, a repair using soil from Willingford Lane. And again, keep the traffic off in the same way. Be patient, see what happens. And then you can become more extensive. Was it May we walked the lane and we looked at I can't it? remember. But I'm anyway, sorry. the two trial sites, I, I started them shortly after that meeting. Mm -hmm. um, we've now got um, the short comfort, I don't know what it's called, um, Burstfoot Treffle, Ribwork Plantain, Cow Parsley, Field Speedwell, Ajunga, Stitchwork, Wort, and um, Daisies and Buttercups. So that's all come on what yes. was previously bare earth? Yes, oh, you and I met. I feel vindicated. <laughs> 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 no, that's good. It shows you it's in the soil. And, and all of your ditches will be full of soil. It's probably got um, local weed, weed seed, wildflower seed, weeds that plant in the wrong place. Um, so use it, do the restorations, and hopefully badger your council, who will do a great deal of it for you. They're, they're on board now. Excellent. They've put the wildlife. Um, the wildflower signs up both ends of the lane. Did you um, contact James Newmarch? He's good. I did, fellow. yes. I think that's another big thing to say yes. about roadside verges wherever you are, is, is get on board with your local parish council, town council, highways. It's a joint approach. Um, yes. and, and he's been very supportive. Yeah, and things have been mowed through in an inch of their lives for years. Mm -hmm. And just stopping mowing is people want to enhance everything. Mm -hmm. But if you just stop mowing, then you're probably going to have four times the, the insect species. I don't know if everybody remembers, I'm old enough to remember going on holiday down to the West Country and having your car covered in insects. And my parents would be getting out cleaning the windscreen. It was an absolute pest. Um, gradually that stopped. You know, it, it wasn't happening. And you know, these insects had gone, but all the verges were being mown. Nothing could complete its life cycle. That's stopping again. We went to Cornwall last year and we were starting to clean the windscreen. Uh, and I think, well, you're peeing. And it's, uh, this uh, cost-cutting <laughs> exercise is brilliant for, the, for biodiversity. Um, um, yeah. Well, I was just going to talk a little bit about seed sowing. Often we, when we're thinking about creating or restoring, we talk about sowing seed in the autumn or spring. Um, I, I, I wonder why we, we talk about that, because uh, in nature, nature does it much earlier in the summer. Uh, and some of the most successful uh, meadow creations I've done here are with green hay, where we've been taking the cut uh, in July and immediately spreading it onto a field that we've prepared. That's what nature is doing. So a yellow rattle seed is falling out um, in July. Um, yellow rattle seed, a bit like orchid seed, is very short-lived, doesn't store very well. Um, and so the quicker you can get that onto your meadow, the better. So my, my advice is if, if you're creating a meadow, then really think about sowing that seed as early as you can, um, July, August. Uh, and then it, it has time to germinate and to establish before the winter sets in. So, um, yeah, more late summer rather than autumn. Year two, not, not year one. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, those are our sort of in advance questions, but I'm conscious that questions might have arisen from the discussion this afternoon and, and there might be people who've thought about questions but just didn't send them to us in time for them to be asked today. So I'm sort of going to open up... Uh, to the floor, really, whether there's any questions others would like to ask. Um, I've got about four and a half, I've five done. acres of grass um, on which I keep south and sheep, and I'm getting a lot of problems with um, reed grass in it. What's the best way to deal with that? 
Well, what do you mean by reed grass? Um, it's rushes. Mar marsh grass, yeah. The, the, the cylindrical spiky stuff? Yeah. yeah. Junkus, which is rushes. Yeah. Okay, that, that's because it's damp. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why? <laughs> what are you managing the grass them for? Um, basically, to feed the sheep. All right. Are you interested in other wildflowers, or is it just you want more grass and less? I, I want less of the marsh grass, the, the spiky stuff, because the sheep won't eat it. Right. That's why it's there. <laughs> it's a difficult situation because there's no easy answer to that. Herbicides can do a little bit, but you have to keep on. But it's like trying not, to keep back. Not used any for 20 years. No, OK. Other than drainage and repeated cutting, I don't think there's any other answer. Just keep topping it. If, if, yeah. You don't actually take a hay crop at any point? Um, there's not enough grass there. OK. Yeah. The sheep eat it all. Yeah, I think... I 100% agree with Ralph, it's just constant topping, but maybe patch topping, not your whole field. I yeah. imagine the sheep will keep the other bits um, under they, control. They eat all round it, but yeah. um, just leave the... the do you have it in patches or is it across no, the, whole the whole field? the whole field. Is it? Actually. Yeah, well maybe you've got to sort of think of the field in thirds, and so that the sheep have always got something to eat, but um, top it to very, very low and then allow that bit to recover and top another bit. And work your way around the field so you've always got something for your sheep to eat but you're also always caning the, the rush grass or as you call it as it, well. will, it will die eventually oh, it's hard work, it's not going to happen in five minutes mm -hmm. and as soon as you stop doing it it'll be back because mm -hmm. as Ralph said it's the, the problem is you've got a damp field so yeah. drainage and a reseed would probably get rid of it altogether but it doesn't sound as though you want to go that route No. the other alternative is to get more marshland flowers in there and, yeah. and treat it as a less intensive um, sheep grazing field and I mean, work with it rather than against it perhaps. but that, that's a, a different approach perhaps from what you're doing mm. at the moment yeah because there, there are rushes and, and rushes yeah. <laughs> um, you know it's, I, presumably what you've got is mainly soft rush or hard rushes Ralph says the real kind of cylindrical ones because there are other rush species that are associated with more botanically diverse grasslands that so would actually want to say. at the top of the field and it runs down. Yeah. And because um, the tractor sinks in the top of the field when I... Sounds lovely. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, t t topping and cattle grazing is a good way of keeping them. But, you know, as you say, you've got sheep, so sheep tend to yeah. avoid them, as, you, as you've, you've pointed out. Mm. Yes, and not what you want to hear, but I'm afraid it probably is an endless task. I have exactly the same problem, if it's any consolation. Thank you. All right, thank you. This one. Hi, I'm um, Bonnie Donbrett from Hooper's Farm. Um, we have four fields in HMS Churchyard, um, wildflower meadow, maintenance or restoration, depending on the field. And um, we have moles that you can see on Google Earth. <laughs> <laughs> which um, create quite a problem I and mean, we can um, harrow them at some times of the year um, but we're quite restricted on that because of the heavy clay and you know, not wanting to interfere with the wildflowers and stuff uh, we've spent a fortune with a mole man but with all the woodland around the moles just come out again and uh, you, might not, you might as well not be bothered any good suggestions? because it really is hampering haymaking uh, yeah. quite a problem with soil in the hay and um, a bumpy, you know. Do you roll it? Uh, well, we haven't been rolling it, no. Um, it's difficult timing because our stewardship um, excludes it from, I think it's early May, um, early mm. April rather, mm. and quite often it's too wet to go Probably in. Probably for ground nesting birds. Yeah, which is not what we're actually going through here. But no, but yeah. it might still be a problem with the skylarks. But you might want to roll it later on, just before you hay cut it. If mm. We're banned from that then. So, I think you could get a derogation, yeah. I presume, if it's really that bad. Yeah. Once moles have got in um, and established their, their roots, it's, it's very, very difficult to get on top of them. I've got a similar problem in Bloomers Valley Meadow, and I, I'm 
very kind of aware of it because visually it spoils the look of the meadow through the winter and then also this time of year the moles are also active. I'll tell you what I do every single morning okay. as I drive in, I drive down to the meadows, I've got a spade in the back and I, I just get rid of the mole hills and spread it. Spread it. And that's purely because um, it offends my eyes. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that I'll drive round to yours yeah, anymore. No. <laughs> but, but it is a problem. It is a problem. And I've also spent quite a lot of money on it. And I've also become a mole trapper myself. And it's about striking the right balance because moles are part of our landscape and they're to be celebrated but it's it's all about the right balance isn't it and when it they're lots of yeah mm. but but also what i found is um that molehill then that that you spread is bare earth and in that then also it's a niche habitat yeah. for all sorts of things to grow so I, I guess i'm sharing my frustrations with, with, which is yes it's frustrating but then if you try and put a positive spin on it uh, it, it creates all sorts of opportunities for things to, to flourish. In. Yeah, it's just going a bit far at the moment, I think. Yeah. If you've got that many, um, they, if you watch, you'll find they will heave at set times of the day. And if you've got a 12 ball and you, you wander around the field <laughs> as they heave, you will make a huge difference. And uh, certainly I've done that. And, uh, and you, you will reduce them to the point you can eradicate them. Just keep walking around, learn when they're heaving. And it's easy to see because you get the fresh molehills. And kick everything over every day so you know where the new hills are. And it's surprising how many hills one mole will be responsible for. And uh, as Ian says, you're creating a niche habitat. And I have seeds in my pockets. And when I kick them over, I sort of salt and pepper the earth with seeds as well. So you'd be surprised how quickly you will start to make a huge difference and how, me how few moles can make a huge mess. Yeah. And it does certainly uh, reduce the quality of your hay. Yeah, so a, mo a single mole o overnight can create mm. a, a dozen big molehills. And, and if you leave that for a week, all of a sudden, yeah, you, you've got 50 to 100 molehills and it can yeah, really look awful. Mm -hmm. So Good. sometimes the problem looks bigger mm -hmm. Than, than it is. Yeah, get, on, but, get on top of them okay. and then you'll see where they're actually working. Watch, they will be heaving at roughly the same time of day, morning and evening, when they're feeding. And with a 12 ball, you shoot into the soil as it's moving and uh, that'll, that really upsets them. That's, <laughs> that's far more extreme than the method I use. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, you can get rid of them. Yeah, it's okay. a lot cheaper than, than having a mole man. Well, yeah, it was mm. 300 pounds for the mole man, yeah. you know, one field. And mm. But, you know, it, mole trapping is not, not that difficult. As I've yeah. found, if, if someone like myself <laughs> can, can do it, then it can't be that difficult. So, yeah, I bought a few traps and um, Googled it. And um, <laughs> it, it's, it's quite exciting every yeah. morning seeing if you've trapped something. <laughs> <laughs> you can get the obstinate few that way. Uh, yeah. Trapping is, is, is good. And every now and again, you get one you just cannot trap. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think they're left handed. They must come <laughs> the other way. <laughs> they're also great preparation for plant plugs. There's, you've got your ready made plants. Oh, I know, yeah, we've used that. We've got quite a lot of glass green and I collect the seeds and use them all here. Right, sadly, I'm going to uh, bring this session to an end. It's quarter past three. I know there are other questions to be asked. I know Matthew's got a question about bramble and control of bramble. And I think we, uh, Julia, you had a question about verges and, and control of um, certain species on verges, didn't you? So um, there's lots of opportunities to ask more questions on the walk this afternoon. Um, so sadly, that's it for this, this year. Um, feedback as to whether this is useful to you or not would be, be great. 
Um, and I'd like to thank Ian again for, for hosting this event and, and thank the panel members for such comprehensive questions and you, the audience, for coming along and asking them. So, so thank you and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you.